by Professor Biman Nath and he has done his uh, MSc from University of Delhi and his PhD from University of Maryland, US. So today he is going to talk about the outlaws from galaxies. I am going to talk about some aspects of um, what we have been doing in our group um, for the last several years and uh, it's about outflows of galaxies from galaxies and um, as you can see in this iconic image of um, a another nearby galaxy M82, um, uh, the gas is being thrown out uh, uh, pretty violently. Uh, so this is the uh, plane of the galaxy and the red light that you see, that red um, uh, uh, color is actually from the H alpha radiation from hydrogen and which is radiated by, uh, since hydrogen is the most abundant uh, element in the universe, it is radiated by gas at uh, roughly around 100,000 uh, degrees Kelvin. And uh, so this is the phenomena that I would like to talk about. Um, it is not only seen in just uh, uh, optical, it is also seen in other wavelengths. For example, this is the same uh, uh, galaxy M82 seen in X-rays and this is infrared and this is also in infrared. So, um, uh, since these uh, different wavelengths, uh, emission at different wavelengths uh, correspond to different physical mechanisms that tell us, uh, give us different clues about the same physical process. This is something that astronomers do very often, look at the same object in different uh, wavelengths. Uh, it is like, uh, like a, a blind man, you know, looking at the elephant. Uh, so, you get different clues and from which you build up a physical picture of what is the uh, phenomena going on. So, as I said, this gas is uh, that, that gives the, the H alpha uh, radiation in red is uh, typically 100,000 degrees Kelvin, whereas in oxygen, uh, so this is line emission. In oxygen, you have line emission, you also have uh, Bremsstrahl and free free uh, uh, radiation and given by gas at a million degrees Kelvin, whereas infrared is, um, is a mixture of again line and uh, continuum emission from dust, which is being heated up, warmed up by the light of the stars and um, it is at a different wavelength. So, all this uh, uh, um, gives you different clues. So, uh, uh, since these uh, emissions come from gas at different temperatures, uh, as you can imagine, this gas contains all different kinds of uh, like fully ionized gas, partially ionized gas, neutral gas, even molecular glass. This is, this is a image of uh, carbon monoxide uh, molecules in the same uh, uh, in the same galaxy, which is radiated by which is uh, so molecules you need to shield them in very cold and dense clouds, very cold, few hundred degrees Kelvin. So all this uh, temperature, gas at different temperatures, they coexist in this outflowing gas. And um, well, so these outflows are seen in galaxies mostly um, with galaxy uh, where the star formation rate is very high. So, for example, M82, we know that it is a smaller galaxy than our galaxy. Uh, how do you know that? From the rotation curve, just like we know we uh, can in the solar system, the case of the solar system, we uh, look at the Earth's rotation speed and that gives you a clue about the gravitational field of the sun. The same way, the rotation curve of uh, rotation speed of stars in, um, a, in a galaxy gives us clue about the depth of the potential well, how big the galaxy is. And this galaxy is smaller than our, our galaxy, less massive. Uh, but the star formation rate in this galaxy is higher, uh, much larger than that of Milky Way. Uh, it is about 10 solar mass per year and that is how we describe the uh, star formation rate. This is the amount of gas which is being uh, uh, transformed into stars per year. Of course, it is not measured year after year, it uh, is it's average taken over tens of millions of years. Uh, and this is much larger than the star formation rate in Milky Way. So, as you can imagine, if it has, if a galaxy has a shallow potential well and it has a larger star formation rate, the, uh, when you form stars, if a certain fraction of stars are going to be very massive, which are going to explode at the end of their, uh, when they run out of their fuel, thermonuclear fuel, and the explosions are going to uh, deposit a lot of energy into the surrounding gas. And so, if the gravitational potential well of the gas uh, galaxy is small, if it is a low mass galaxy, then the effect of the star formation rate will be much more uh, spectacular. And this is what is happening here. Gas is being thrown out 
with uh, speeds of a uh, few hundred kilometers per second from the, uh, from the plane of the galaxy. And uh, now this is very important, this, this phenomenon of outflow uh, is important uh, to understand the evolution of galaxies. Why? Because it's throwing out a lot of gas and you need gas to form stars. So when you form stars, if the process of the very process of star formation is, uh, creates a, 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 a situation where a, a lot of gas is being thrown out, then you're going to deprive the next generation of stars to uh, come from, you know. So this is like a negative feedback. It's like a uh, negative feedback mechanism on the star formation process. So with all other negative feedback processes, this regulates the star formation process, regulates the star formation rate in galaxies. Um, and which is why it's important to understand, uh, in order to understand the uh, evolution of galaxies. Otherwise, you could have imagined that, you know, this, all the gas which were available to form stars would have formed stars. And uh, then, you know, with the, when the galaxies uh, formed uh, in the universe, the universe would have had a brief and bright phase and then just plunged into darkness, which it hasn't happened. So the galaxies have um, produced stars at a very slow and steady rate and a regulated rate and the, the clue lies in the process of throwing out gas once in a while. Um, so this, the, the, this will probably mo make more sense if I, so this is a collage of, uh, uh, of different galaxies. This is NGC, uh, 250, this is again X-ray in Rosa, these are again X-ray, these are optical, and you can see the same phenomena in different wavelengths. Yes. Yeah, so some of this gas will probably turn back uh, and then, but some of it will probably just remain in, in, in uh, surrounding the galaxy or some of it may just go to the intergalactic medium, depending on that. So if we look at the process of star formation, uh, the formation of galaxies, then this will probably uh, make more sense to you why outflows are important. So if you look at the, uh, the map of, uh, uh, of the universe, local universe, so the, each point is a galaxy, uh, we are here in the center, and forget about the colors, uh, the colors just represent the, the crowding of the points. And here's a redshift, which is a proxy for distances, because as we look farther, we look back in time, so redshift is like, proxy for time and uh, distance. So what you see is that the, the, the distribution of matter in the universe is far from being uniform. There are, there's a, galaxies are structures of course, and then there are clusters of galaxies, there are clusters of clusters of galaxies. There's a hierarchy of structures in the universe. And how did it all form from a nearly uniform soup of primordial soup? Uh, is that uh, one, uh, we think that, you know, uh, it started with very, uh, small density fluctuations very early in the universe, which if, since gravity just attracts, slightly dense, slightly over dense regions would have become even denser with time and slightly less dense regions would have become even less uh, dense with time. So the density contrast would increase with gravity. So if you start with small density in homogeneities, it will form structures at some point. And since most of the matter in the universe, as you know, is more made of dark matter, so this is uh, the, the sort of uh, energy, uh, matter energy budget inventory of the universe, forget about this dark energy part, the, uh, the purple, the, the, the dark matter, here's a dark matter, and this is what we are made of, people, uh, uh, matter that we are familiar with in the periodic table, that is about one-sixth of the total amount of matter, and just of the matter is there, but it, it doesn't shine, right? So, uh, so the gravitational uh, potential is basically basically given by the dark matter. Uh, the, uh, the, the normal matter is just like a test particle. So, clumps of dark matter emerge as the potential sites of galaxy formation, and this is a, um, I can, yeah, this is a simulation which shows that, uh, so Z uh, means redshift, uh, decreasing means going uh, ahead in time, so small density fluctuations are increasing in, uh, 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 in, in contrast, in amplitude, and uh, um, structures that we see today in the, in the galaxy map uh, is emerging just out of gravity. Um, and this is the story, this is a, actually, yep. So I had a basic question. So you are assuming the volume to remain constant. Yeah, so this is the inverse, uh, expansion of the universe has been taken out of this. 
Okay, it's a co-moving volume. So, because that can, uh, it's easier to see it this way. Okay. And how do you know that this story is correct? Because, well, there are many uh, tests have been done. One of the tests come from studying the uh, uh, cosmic microwave background radiation, which you know has a, a perfect Planckian spectrum with temperature of 2.7 to 6 uh, degrees Kelvin. And why uh, is there a Planckian radiation there? Because, uh, uh, so this is a cartoon uh, brief uh, thermal history of the universe. We are here at the present. And at the very early universe, matter and radiation were in, um, uh, in thermal equilibrium because they were denser and hotter, so they were strongly interacting. So you expect a Planckian radiation to emerge. Um, and most of the radiation, most of the interaction was just Thomson scattering between ionized uh, gas, which is a free electron, and the radiation. But when the universe became colder than, say, uh, 4,000 degrees Kelvin, it formed atoms. And as you know, the, uh, the, the interaction between photons and atoms is limited by only transition uh, uh, laws. So most of the photons basically started uh, streaming freely. And that's the radiation that we see today as microwave background photons. So in, uh, although I said, you know, the, the temperature is fairly uniform, if you go to the fourth decimal point, you start seeing an isotropies. In different directions, the temperature is slightly hotter and colder. And since this, so this radiation is coming to us when, uh, from a time when the universe was about 400,000 years old. It's like a fossil. And it's telling us about the state of affairs, the state of uh, when the universe was that old. And why should the temperature be hotter and colder in certain places? Because of the density in homogeneous back then. When the, uh, as you know, the a photon climbs out of a potential well, it, it cools down, it loses energy. So, so when you look at the anisotropy uh, map of the uh, micro, uh, micro background uh, in the universe, it's basically telling us about the density fluctuations back then, when the uh, universe was just about 300,000 years old. And you let gravity work on it, and you see, you get what we see today. And that story has worked out just fine, I mean, more or less. And so the story is that uh, you have dark matter uh, uh, clumps, uh, which then, um, but the dark matter doesn't dissipate. Dark matter is collisionless. It, 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 they, 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 the dark matter particles, although we don't know what they are, but they're supposed to interact only gravitationally. So they don't dissipate, but normal uh, matter does. So when the dark matter uh, potential well and normal matter falls into it, it dissipates energy, angular momentum, and so it basically shrinks in size and occupies a much smaller uh, volume. And that's where it cools and fragments and forms stars and this galaxy then shines, becomes luminous. And the idea is that the, the gas, the cooling has to be faster than it can fall uh, into the potential well. So the cooling time has to be less than the dynamical time scale. That simple prescription actually tells us a lot about uh, uh, galaxy formation. For example, you can use this and get a characteristic size and mass of galaxies, which is remarkable actually. Uh, so all this is very fine, but there are problems with the details. So when you look at the, for example, the abundances, of, yeah. So think about, so we don't know what it is, but uh, if I, even then, there is some something that's preventing complete collapse of dark matter, right? So what, otherwise you would imagine that if it was gravitation, gravitating, you didn't have any regular matter, suppose, that only dark matter, it would anyway have these fluctuations and come, become denser and denser and denser over time. Uh, but just like in a star, there's a point at which you have something pressing outward, right? Uh, if you have non-interaction, non-interacting... So it's, it's going to take a long time. There's cold... So, so dark, you're uh, saying that matter. given the given the time the, scale that we have, we have not seen that yes. process. Okay, yes. thanks. Okay, so when you look at the abundances of uh, galaxies at different mass bins, for example, that's where the problem starts. So uh, this is relative number and as a function of mass, and this is what one expects from theoretical expectations of structure formation models. So these are dark matter halos, and as I said, one sixth of it just uh, makes what galaxies luminous. So this is what you expect. The dashed line is what you expect as the abundances of uh, different uh, uh, galaxies, uh, different structures. I mean, including galaxy structures. 
But what you see is very different, qualitatively very different, quantitatively very different. This is what uh, is observed. Um, it sort of matches around the Milky Way galaxy, which is uh, probably a coincidence. Um, but as you can see, there is a deficit here, there is a deficit here. And that's where we think the outflows can uh, 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 become important in, uh, to study. Because these galaxies are low mass galaxies, so they have shallow potential well. And so, star formation process would basically drive, may drive out uh, gas from them and make them dimmer and then make this uh, abundance, uh, uh, their abundance less. Here also maybe something similar is happening at high mass, but it's a different story where uh, these large and massive galaxies probably have black holes, has, they have black holes and it's a different sort of physics. So, I'm not going to talk about this, I'm going to uh, concentrate only on this. But if you just look at the, just the process of star formation also, I mean that also uh, 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 poses some questions. Um, I mean, when uh, a cloud in the interstellar medium, it forms stars, it basically uh, collapses on its own, on its, uh, due to its own gravity and it forms stars. So, if gravity were the only story, then I could have said I can, I should be able to estimate the star formation rate by just dividing the mass of the cloud by some sort of time scale, which is the, the, the dynamical time scale, the free fall time scale. Actually, that uh, correlation bears out when you look at observationally. Well, observationally, you can't really talk about the cloud as massive, you talk about surface densities. But even then, this is the surface density, a star, star formation rate density, and this is star, uh, surface density of gas divided by some free fall time scale. And there is a correlation between but the normalization is the problem. Uh, the normalization is of the order of 2 percent. And the question is why is it different from order of unity? Why isn't it of the order of unity? Why this process of star formation is so inefficient? And that's where we think again, you know, you, uh, the outflows uh, from the time, uh, time to time it throws out gas and makes the process of star formation inefficient. Uh, this uh, sort of um, is reflected if, uh, when you look at uh, the baryon fraction, which we know, as I said, one sixth of it, one sixth of the total amount of matter we should see as baryons. Uh, now, uh, if you see across structures of different masses, so circular velocity is a proxy for mass. As you can see, large objects have, this is the cosmic baryon fraction. This is what we expect from just Big Bang nuclear synthesis, one sixth. So, large structures have been able to hold on to their uh, uh, share of baryons, whereas low mass objects, they do not, they, they, they do not have such much baryons. And so, again, it is it's a question of their having uh, 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 gravitational field being weaker and then not being able to hold on to their gas. If you look at it, the whole uh, uh, thing, th this process from another point of view, which is the point of view of the intergalactic medium. Now, there is gas which is left over from the uh, whole process of galaxy formation. As I said, dark matter clumps are the sites of galaxy formation and the normal matter falls into it. But this, a lot of uh, gas is also left over. It's a huge amount of gas, but it is very, very tenuous, very, very tenuous. So, of the order of 10 to the 1 minus, less than 10 to the 1 minus 5 particles per cc, okay. It is actually, if you think of it, it is very, very small. But uh, you can, I mean, it's so small that if you put about 10 snowflakes into the volume of the total earth, you'll get that density, okay. So, this is really, really uh, 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 tenuous, but uh, it shows up in observations. For example, if you look at, uh, we, if you look at very distant and bright quasars, in the line of sight, there may be clouds in the intergalactic medium, which will absorb lines. And of course, you see hydrogen because hydrogen is the most abundant uh, element. You see limon alpha, limon beta, limon series. But you also see other elements like calcium, uh, uh, iron, magnesium, you name it, it has it. But at a very low abundance, abundance is like one thousandth of what you see in, uh, in the sun, the, the abundance of these heavy elements. Now, we know that the heavy elements are created and produced in the cores of the stars. And in the environment of this intergalactic medium, which is so rarefied, you can't uh, have stars uh, forming there. So, how did the uh, heavy elements reach there? 
The only way is to for the galaxies to throw out once in a while their own reserve of metals and to pollute or enrich the intergalactic medium. And so, these outflows you need uh, uh, um, in, uh, from the galaxies to explain this phenomenon. All right. Not from the earliest galaxies. From the Say it again. earliest galaxies, you don't expect this kind no, of No, actually, thing. you expect more from the earliest galaxies because in the structure formation process is like a bottom off scenario. So, which means you form small galaxies first and they merge to become a larger and larger galaxy. The small galaxies have weaker potential value. So, they were they are more vulnerable to losing gas. So, are they as uh, rich in all of these? Are the earliest mm. galaxies as rich in all no, of these? Not so rich, but you have to integrate over time. So, you need to build the models in which uh, galaxies are okay. getting more and more metal rich, heavy metal, heavy element rich. But that requires you to then look for uh, smaller redshift galaxies, right? You, uh, also, at higher redshift, the by about redshift of, so these, these observations are at redshift of 3 or so. By redshift of 3, uh, um, the galaxies have become fairly okay. metal rich. Okay, but yeah. okay. So. And you have the time from the the cosmic dawn which probably happened around 15, 20. So, you have enough time. So, how do you make sure that uh, these elements are in the intergalactic medium from the observations? Of the observations. So, from the observation, how do you know it is coming from the galaxy itself? Oh, so, uh, no, I mean, I mean there are no galaxies in the in the line of sight. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. okay. So, the cloud doesn't have this. So, the, the clouds actually have contain all these elements, but these are very fluffy uh, tenuous clouds in the intergalactic medium, slightly over dense from the density that I just told you. Yeah. So, when the galaxies actually um, send these clouds, I mean these things outside, how far does it go because you said there are no galaxies. Yeah. So, that is a question, I will come back to this. It's a very good question. I, yeah. Um, so and, and uh, so to coming back to so from another point of view, say from the point of view of Milky Way, it looks like there are signs even in our own galaxy of uh, outflows of. Um, so this is a gamma ray map of Milky Way from the position uh, from our vantage point, and you can see uh, a bubble-like uh, features in the gamma ray map. This is a better uh, map, which is noise having been uh, subtracted. So, this is has been talked about as uh, signatures of um, effect of uh, the star formation in the center uh, central region of Milky Way. So, uh, okay, so how am I doing in time? Okay, so I would like to talk about what are the questions that we ask and, uh, and, and why and so this is the motivation and the questions that we have been uh, that, that are interesting to us. Uh, put in to at different length scales. For example, at small length scale, there are certain interesting questions. So, for example, if you look at the uh, at smaller length scale, like a few hundred parsecs, few hundred light years. So, this is a cartoon picture of the Milky Way, for example. If you look at the very central region of the Milky Way, a few hundred parsecs here, it is very dense. The gas is very dense. And the question is, well, I mean, if galactic winds are uh, launched by the effect of massive stars exploding and dumping energy and making the gas hot and uh, so that the uh, the thermal energy uh, the, 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 the the random uh, speed of the atoms is larger than the escape speed. So, that is the like, thermal pressure is throwing it out. But in that case, because of the density, there would be a lot of radiation loss because the radiation mechanism is such that these are two body radiation mechanism line 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 uh, uh, radiation. So, that when the the shock waves propagate into the intergalactic medium, a lot of energy is expected to be lost. So, how is it that in you need dense region to form stars and at the same time when you form stars and you explode the stars in the dense region, you are expected to lose a lot of energy. So, how is it that you know you still have energy and uh, the gas still has energy and, and, and throws out so, these are the questions uh, that uh, one asks for example and uh, what we found is that you need to form stars uh, in a very coherent manner or the supernova uh, above a certain density and rate I mean like per unit volume per unit time there has to be certain limit certain threshold. So, that 
you form uh, stars here and then some of them will go supernova depending on their mass they will go supernova earlier or later and then as you can see it sweeps up gas here but it also loses energy it's losing its steam now by that time it loses its like uh, all of its thermal energy if another uh, nearby supernova explodes then um, so you need to have a certain uh, you know rate density so here is a for example a, uh, a simulation and, and of different rate densities these are um, at different rates so this is a slightly higher rate density uh, and this is sh color showing the density here it's a density map um, so low density would mean very hot gas so as you can you'll see I'll, I'll run it again this is a very high uh, density rate kind of situation where it has been able to re retain its temperature retain its thermal pressure whereas in other case if the rate density is small enough it will just lose its steam by uh, by by radiation so i'll just do this again here the rate density is low so it just loses its thermal pressure very very fast whereas in this case if it is done in a coherent manner then it uh, retains its energy so these are the, some of the questions that we ask at do simulations and so for example at uh, a larger slightly larger scale one can then ask question well thermal pressure is one thing what about other kind of pressure like uh, cosmic ray pressure by radiation pressure there is radiation from uh, stellar uh, uh, radiation um, so for example you know radiation pressure is impo important we know that in the case of comets right I mean, you see the tails Cosmic rays are high energy particles which are accelerated by the supernova shock themselves. And the cosmic rays are very highly energetic particles. And they, you can think of them as a fluid, a relativistic fluid. So it has its own pressure. So does this pressure uh, help or uh, how does it affect the dynamics of the, uh, uh, the outflows? This is one of the questions. Other questions, for example, at, yeah. Yeah, so in this in this direction, it is difficult to uh, uh, propagate. It's uh, so it's just the plane, the galactic uh, plane, has a stratified atmosphere. So uh, you can think of strat so so lower density in this way vertically. So yeah, in fact, the shape and the study of you know all these things came from mostly from the study of the uh, nuclear bomb in our atmosphere, the mushroom clouds, right? Um, right. At a larger scale, for example, one can ask questions like, so uh, uh, the visible part of our galaxy is a very small part uh, and is surrounded by um, a very tenuous and hot gas. Uh, this is the cartoon picture. And, uh, and the question then one can ask, I mean, it's not as tenuous as the intergalactic medium, but is still uh, tenuous compared to the, uh, the visible part of our galaxy. The question then one can ask, what is how does the outflow interact with this what we call the circumgalactic medium? Uh, maybe some part of it, it just re, it, it remains there, some part of it just rains back down on our plane and then triggers more star formation rate, etc. etc. So, all these questions uh, one can ask. So, uh, so for example, this is a, a, a simulation that uh, Kartik Sarkar had done, and it this is a 250 kiloparsec. This shows temperature. This is density map uh, and this is uh, 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 trying to um, uh, simulate a galaxy which is uh, producing stars at a slightly larger rate than Milky Way. So I will show it again and from there we try to understand. So once you have density map, temperature map, you can actually uh, try to model how it should look in different wavelengths. So for example, we can uh, make maps and uh, the 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 resemblance with the mushroom cloud is not a coincidence here, of course. Um, so this is, for example, the density and temperature map from where one can uh, uh, sim uh, as make a simulated map of in X-ray, gamma ray, and in microwave, and then compare with the observations of Milky Way, of the Fermi bubble. And this is how one can compare your models, your physical understanding of the process, and then uh, with the observations. Um, so here we had um, uh, had star formation only in the center. Then uh, we went to do something more complicated where we had uh, distributed star formation towards uh, throughout the plane of the galaxy. And Aditi, who was a student here, did these simulations 
where the star formation, these are the star uh, formation sites and this is at a later time, this is how the densities, they would basically uh, make uh, uh, bubbles around them. Some of these bubbles would merge, some of will, will not. And then uh, we wanted to understand how the X-rays, uh, it will show up in X-rays, for example. So these clumps of gas is lifted by the hot injected gas. And it turned out very interesting. Initially, people thought that the X-ray is mostly emitted by the embedding. The, the, so you have gas coming out and the gas sometimes cools to form clouds. So this is a hot gas and they have cold clouds embedded in hot gas. So people used to think that you know most of the X-ray is coming out from coming from the hot gas. It turns out that most of the emission comes from this this cold clumps are uh, and this is the hot injected gas is coming out. This is like a bow shock, and so there's a bow shock where there you have intermediate uh, uh, temperature that gives boost of the uh, X-ray. So we try to simulate that. So this uh, is temperature and density um, a, uh, and this is in, this is pressure and this is the X-ray, soft X-ray emission. And then, so we try to then compare with the X-ray observations. We try to compare with, for example, radio. So for this, you need to uh, do MHD simulation, where magnetohydrodynamic simulations, and you inject particles, which we didn't really have. We uh, So we made some toy model in order to understand how synchrotron radiation would be produced by high energy electrons in magnetic field. And then we made simulated maps of how, what should be the radio emission uh, of uh, a galaxy which is throwing out uh, gas, magnetized gas uh, and also. So then uh, this is one of the advantages of working in an institute like RRI. You have uh, uh, radio astronomer colleagues. So when I talk to my colleagues, they, they this is Dwarkanath. Uh, so, he, he suggested we should test it out. So, we have uh, GMRT, uh, Giant Meteorological Radio Telescope in Pune. Why not uh, 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 select a galaxy which is looks like edge on, which is not very far away, which has star formation rate similar to what you have simulated and then observe what the radio emission looks like and then compare. So, so this was just before the uh, pandemic. So we looked at uh, a galaxy NGC 4631. Um, so as I was saying, you know, working in an institute like uh, RRI can make me like a theorist also work on with, uh, uh, you know, uh, with real data. Um, so we went to, this is just before the pandemic, we went to GMRT, took the data, and then during the pandemic, we worked it out. This is, the, this is what we saw. Now this is not, it was similar to what we had expected, but not quite. So it sent us back to the drawing board and uh, we realized that some of the assumptions that we had made during the simulation was not quite right. So we changed those uh, assumptions. Uh, but this is fun. This is, this is, this is interesting. I mean, uh, you, a theorist makes a prediction, uh, compares with observations and, you know, you uh, come back to the drawing board and then you change your uh, ideas. Anyway, so uh, so this is some of the things that we have done. As a byproduct, I would like to tell you a story of a, a sort of a byproduct of that of uh, what we have been doing. So, in order to understand the effect of radiation pressure and cosmic ray pressure, I realized that you know you, one should probably look at even at a smaller uh, length scale, uh, not at a galaxy scale, but even at the scale of star clusters, massive star clusters, uh, because most of the action is happening there. Most of the 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 galactic, uh, galactic winds are actually launched by superstar clusters. So we looked at um, OB associations and uh, these OB stars are basically massive stars. And uh, uh, so we wanted to ask what are the roles of radiation pressure and cosmic ray pressure in those bubbles. So you have stellar winds coming out of these massive stars. Massive stars are very luminous. So the radiation pressure actually throws out a lot of gas and this uh, stellar wind basically shocks uh, the intermediate, uh, immediate surroundings. And then we worked out, and a, a, as you can see here, this is the uh, ratio of radiation pressure to uh, the supernova pressure. And as a function of time, we realized that as the star clusters evolves, in the very beginning, in the very uh, initial phases, radiation pressure can be important. Then we asked the question of cosmic rays. And we realized we bumped into something very interesting. We had no idea 
we realized that the shocks uh, produced by the stellar wind is very, very strong, very high Mach number shock, and that can accelerate cosmic rays. That's very different from the standard paradigm of cosmic rays. You would hear, uh, one hears the standard scenario that cosmic rays are mostly produced by supernova shocks, right? Now, these are, this is a different site altogether. And this is not talked about, but people have uh, uh, once in a while uh, um, mentioned that, you know, it's possible to cos uh, accelerate cosmic rays there. Then we realized, we, we studied, we, we uh, dug deeper, and then we asked the question, okay, if there are cosmic rays, then it's going to uh, decrease the thermal pressure, which means it's going to decrease the uh, X-ray luminosity. And then do we see that? And actually we found that, yes, it's, if you put cosmic rays there, yep. So the massive stars, so the star clusters have very massive stars, and the massive stars are very, very luminous. And so the radiation pressure actually makes them, uh, makes, uh, 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 wind out of these uh, stars. And so the wind, when it uh, uh, interacts with the matter, then it produces a shock. It's so like a wind termination shock. And it's very high Mach number shock. And uh, then we uh, uh, realize that, you know, there are lots of clues that even gamma ray, X-ray luminosity is telling us something about the cosmic rays there. Then uh, a student, uh, uh, Siddharth Gupta, who is now in Chicago, and actually doing uh, very uh, interesting work on cosmic ray acceleration. Now, he did these simulations of star cluster. Um, so, this is at a different, this is zoomed in here, this is zoomed in here. And this is the wind termination shock. I'll, I'll run it again. So, this is the wind termination shock. This is combined, so these are the individual OB stars, okay. And the combined wind of these uh, OB stars is producing a shock, which is uh, delineated by uh, this is a this is a wind termination shock. This is a outer shock there. And the interesting thing about cosmic rays being yeah. Uh, yeah. Let's say one time emission. Yes, yeah, so one time. Injection. Yes, this is a okay. continuous yeah. continuous energy injection but is going on for a while. Yeah. Are the physics of the you know shock front development quite different? It's different. That's like a blast wave, like a one time like energy being deposited at one time at one place. This is continuous energy injection. For a while, as long as these stars have not gone supernova. Like, like millions of years. Um, millions of years, right? Depending on the, uh, so these are very high massive stars. So the first stars, uh, so, so from five to few, say 20 million years, is, uh, you still have the winds. So you are absolutely right. The, the, the physics of the shocks are in, uh, very different. So outside would be embedded in a molecular cloud, most likely. These these things are embedded in a molecular cloud. I mean, stars form in a molecular cloud. All the massive star clusters, right? So the that will be the environment, which will be very dense. A few hundred. Not only just galaxy, but it's a molecular uh, cloud environment, dense and dense and cold. Yes, yes. So the interesting thing is, in the case of supernova the particles which are being accelerated come from the interstellar medium. Whereas here, the particles which are being accelerated come from the massive stars themselves, which have different abundance patterns, especially different isotope patterns. And then there was actually found that, you know, there's a, a long-standing puzzle of neon isotope ratio in the cosmic rays, which cannot be explained by standard scenario of accelerating with supernova. We use the, uh, uh, the abundances of massive stars and then the simulations, we realize that we can actually solve this problem. So, we realize that we you know, bumped into something else, but something more interesting that, and uh, that uh, uh, star clusters also produce cosmic rays and probably contributes to about say one third to one fourth of the galactic population of cosmic rays. And in this uh, paper that we have just submitted last month, we have uh, shown that the galactic cosmic ray spectrum um, this is the galactic cosmic ray spectrum multiplied by E cube, so that it's not like power law like this. So as a function of energy, so these low energy cosmic rays, just look at the dashed light, uh, dashed line, that comes from supernova. The dotted line comes from extragalactic objects because they're very, very energetic particles that cannot be confined within our galaxy. That has to come from extragalactic. In between, 
So this is called the knee and this is called the ankle. Between this knee and ankle, within about say 10 to the power 17, 18, there is a gap that cannot be explained by supernova or by uh, extragalactic objects. And that gap can be filled by invoking cosmic ray acceleration in massive stars, the clusters. And so this is our modeling of the massive star, uh, uh, the cosmic rays from massive star clusters. We have taken their, uh, the observed position in the galactic disk uh, and the propagation mechanism and well, and this is still under review. So I would, I wanted to say something about cosmic ray pressure, but uh, I'll skip that uh, because it's getting late. And um, I'll just mention something that I'm doing right now. So you, uh, you must have seen all of you have seen this picture from James Webb Space Telescope, uh, and and the uh, basically the story is that you know it has been finding uh, a lot of bright uh, high redshift galaxies, very early galaxies, large number of them, and uh, well, I mean at least right now they are still not confirmed spectroscopically. They are still photometric uh, redshifts. Uh, which needs to be confirmed, but at, the, at least there are there is one galaxy at redshift of 11, which was found by HST, and then uh, Keck Telescope has uh, confirmed its spectroscopic redshift. So these are the lines. For example, this is a line that is from the UV, which has been redshifted to infrared. This is a very very high redshift galaxy. Okay, um, and so these are uh, so this is a galaxy. It's a very weird galaxy at redshift of 11. At redshift of 11. The universe is just about 400 mega years old, and this galaxy seems to have, from studying its uh, 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 the spectrum, you can estimate its you can estimate its stellar mass, the number of stars, the the, uh, the mass in stars, which is of the order billion uh, solar mass. So within a 400 million years, it has already formed a billion solar mass. More interesting thing is, and it's very bright. Uh, which is, of course, which is why we uh, one is able to see this. Another interesting thing from that has come from its uh, spectrum is that it doesn't have any dust, hardly any dust attenuation. So a huge amount of star has been formed, which means uh, a lot of supernova also have gone in, which means a lot of metals have been heavy elements have been produced, which means a lot of dust should have been produced. But there's there's hardly any dust. So uh, we're trying to um, understand why. So the, 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 the idea is that somehow these are dust-free galaxies, which is why uh, these uh, James Webb has been picking up such a large abundances of uh, uh, luminous galaxies. The question is why they are dust-free. So the idea is that maybe again outflow. So the, uh, the heavy amount of star formation rate uh, maybe ejects gas and the uh, the dust along with it and sort of lifts the fog in a way and then makes them uh, very transparent. So I am still working on it. Um, so this is just work in progress. This is uh, uh, the uh, uh, snapshots at different time scale. Yep. So if you have ejected the dust, I mean, shouldn't you also be seeing processes in which the dust is being ejected? I mean, maybe maybe they are not enough for you to see right yeah, now. Yeah, so but as we see more seeing, and more, yeah. more examples, maybe we will see. So what we are trying to calculate here, it also depends on how much of dust is being destroyed because you, these dust grains can get very easily destroyed in shock waves. The shock waves, if it uh, has a speed of about say 100 km per second, the, it is going to produce a temperature of million degrees and if the density is high enough, then the, there is what is called the sputtering of dust. I mean you the impinge high uh, ions, uh, heavy uh, higher energetic ions and just basically obliterate this dust grains. Then, no, no, it just gets into the gas phase. So the the matter is heavy element is uh, there in the gas phase, also in the grain phase. So you uh, turn from the grain to the dust, basically. So, uh, but then that will uh, affect their infrared properties. So one has to be very careful about the dust destruction processes. So we work working on it, and so I'll stop here to. Uh, just to summarize, there's nothing to summarize really, it's the, everything is a work in progress. That outflows are very important for, uh, uh, in uh, order to study galactic evolution. And what makes it interesting is the complex interplay of different physical processes, you know, um, at the same time. And what makes it even more interesting is that there's a lot of data. 
and the more, there's going to be more data coming out uh, given the, uh, the number of uh, space probes being sent. Thank you. So let's thank the speaker and any questions? Cosmetics of higher energy are accelerated due to supernova remnants and so on. But uh, the neutron stars, leftover neutron stars, would probably be active in producing uh, uh, particular outflows for a much longer period. You can see the uh, uh, pulsar, wind, uh, pulsar, nebula. pulsar wind nebula. Pulsar wind nebula, or sometimes just a, you know, it may not be a nebular form. Uh, active neutron star would still be producing that particular outflow. Is that of any relevance? Yeah, this is something that I have not studied yet. Pulsar wind nebula. Uh, 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 I should say nothing because I have not really thought about it. And in the JWST spectrum, yeah. what are the emission lines? This is C3. No, I mean the emission line comes from Earth. This is not stellar absorption line. No, this is the ISM. This is ISM lines. So the, uh, 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 if there is an outflow velocity uh, along with this, uh, there will be the shifts. Yes. Shift measurement is probably. Uncertain. Yes, yes, but uh, that is going to be very, very small compared to the redshift uh, at 11. Uh, we have a few more samples around redshift of 10, right? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> percent. Yeah. Uh, we have a few more uh, galaxies, I guess, detected at around redshift of 10 that have spectroscopic surveys from HST and CAC2. So this whole dust-free regime, uh, is it? I thought all there was only one, only one uh, spectroscopically conf confirmed. There are more. Okay. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> Just wanted to know if this dust-free environment is it like a, a one-off from this? This or? is being talked about that you know if you look at the luminosity function, that is uh, very different from what is expected. Yeah. So people have basically invoked that it has to be dust-free. Um, I mean, this is one of the mechanisms. But um, so there is a paper by Ferrara and others who talked about uh, making it them dust-free. But what makes them dust-free is still left to. So we're trying to. Uh, give some physical uh, uh, explanation for that. The effect of dust uh, the absorption, it gets integrated along the line of sight, right? Yeah. So is there any way, I mean, do you, is it possible to say where the dust is? Is it close to the galaxy or not? Or that information is not available? For this, I mean, the, the dust this, in this the intergalactic medium is going to be very, very, there's hardly any dust in the intergalactic, there probably is some dust in the intergalactic medium. But that's probably very, very tiny uh, amount. So, okay, so if, if there is significant absorption, then it's assumed that it's close to the galaxy. It's close to the galaxy, yeah. Uh, so if the redshift, if the redshift markers are not enough for that? Redshift? The redshift of the spectral yeah. shift, they're not enough to tell you that there's no source mass from the galaxy? No, we don't know the redshift of the dust. So the dust attenuation is estimated from the shape of the spectrum. It's literally really uh, me scattering. Yes. So is this a short wavelength? Uh, yeah, uh, tells us about the dust. Also, the environment like that there was no uh, large st uh, structure formation. Yeah, who so knows that environment? So which is why I mean it's very surprising that they it's they're picking up such large. Uh, number of such galaxies and each almost each of them have seem to have billion solar mass in the nine solar mass of stars look at the uh, age of the uh, universe at that time like few hundred mega years so lambda cdm uh, uh, cosmology whether it works the, uh, the in that yeah, way so that's an uh, interesting question so uh, because but for that to be able to put some constraint and challenge these theories you need more more uh, such specimens. Yeah, so that, you, know, you, you need to have a luminosity function. Uh, ah, yeah. A few just uh, here and there, one can still say, oh, it's a, it's a 50 sigma event. It's a rare event. But you need to, uh, if you statistics have more statistics. More, yeah. So, yeah. One of these galaxies, if you find an EGN as well, that would be even more terrible. Yes, oh, Ratchet to 11, if you see EGN like uh, 10 to the power uh, 
supermassive black hole, then that would be a real problem. How would you form? <laughs> yes. All right. Thank you. So oh. Even for this, even for these low mass galaxies, now AGN is used to explain like some outflow, some heating, etc. Yes, of course, so, there will be a, a mixture of both activities from star formation and from AGN activity. Yes, you're right. Also, this uh, how, where dust is formed, it was considered that okay around this supernova, these shocks thing. Where does what form? Uh, where does dust forms? Uh -huh. But then it was considered that okay, it, it should also be forming around stars because early dust was uh, discovered. So, so that means the dust was discovered at those redshift. In like, fact, the, I thought the earlier idea was that it's around the uh, circumstellar uh, environment. The supernova idea came later, I think. Um, so this a, a B stars that there was this another uh, preposition that where dust forms. So it was that okay maybe around A B stars also, and then it was that that's why we discover uh, dust even when supernova would not have happened like mm -hmm. uh, so early in the universe. Right. I think. So what she's talking about, I mean the 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 the, the region around the stars when the stars become large like giants uh, phase, then it can have. It can the temperature can be not so hot, not so, not so cold, and the density is right in the uh, 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 you know conducive uh, regime where you can form grains. Is there any idea in the stellar population of this thing already? Is there any idea in this particular galaxy, the stellar population, what it could be? Is it all very hot stars only? I mean, is that uh, kind that of we don't have any idea? You say the, uh, yeah, the mass function. Okay. No, uh, the the uh, the ideas of metallicity is about point one, but that's about it. Let's thank the thank speaker you. once more.